Welcome to day 16. I, hopefully everyone can see my screen share here of the PowerPoint. We've got a lot of ground to cover in what's a uh, vast and of course, synthetically important family of transformations, catalytic cross coupling. So we will jump right in without further ado. Um, Oops. So some of this will be familiar reactions that you are, have, are used to and have even run yourself in the lab. So I'll try to touch on enough um, what I think are interesting historical developments and then new or newish applications that even if you've seen a lot of this material before, hopefully it's it's still it's still you can take something new um, from from this um, from, from from today's class. Um, so let's first talk about just what what we mean when we say a cross coupling um, and and general categories for for just thinking about um, about um, electron accounting and, and the redox processes involved. Um, and, and so I, I would say cross coupling in general is a pretty ill defined term. Um, if, if you really want to be um, as strict as possible, you'd probably you'd probably limit cross coupling to refer to, to, to what I've highlighted in the pink arrow, these traditional polarity organometallic nucleophile plus organo um, halide or pseudo halide electrophile with a palladium, nickel, copper, iron, or cobalt catalyst to form a new CC bond. Um, but as you'll see that these general reactivity principles can be applied to see heteroatom bond formation. They can be applied to different polarity modes. Um, and so I think cross coupling in a sense has really come to encompass any, any sort of like modular two component reaction that you can Imagine. So I'll try to stay within this general theme of reactions that follow um, this general catalytic cycle of um, the, this, the, 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 the sort of uh, um, a triumvirate, the, key, the three key steps, the, 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 the cross coupling holy trinity of oxidative addition, transmetallation, and productive elimination. Um, and certainly in the, um, uh, th this, this is, um, the, 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 the most um, kind of common order of elementary steps, but you can imagine an alter, alternative order where you have a transmetallation event first, followed by oxidative addition and reductive elimination. And I think we'll see some of that in Tianning's guest lecture um, next week. So, um, and that's especially important in reductive couplings, especially important with first row metals, nickel, iron, cobalt, Etc. But with with palladium, um, typically it's it's this cycle shown, well defined two electron processes that begin with oxidative addition. Um, in the coupling with organometallic reagents, um, transmetallation can often be uh, the the turnover limiting step, though that's that's not always the case. So I'll just draw that in in parentheses. Um, and we'll see many examples of this just manifested through different reaction types. So what I think when, when, when Joe gave a TA guest lecture for this class, he said, you'll see this catalytic cycle so many times in today's class, you'll go to sleep dreaming it. Uh, and, 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 uh, and so I don't know if that's true or not, but you'll, 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 you'll get many, many opportunities to, to see how this manifests itself. So this is the traditional polarity mode and there are also other polarity modes that you can imagine. So you can cross couple, and, and here I'm just using cross couple to mean two different reaction partners. You can cross couple um, two organometallic reagents in an oxidative mode. And then the key here is that you need to have some terminal oxidant to turn over the catalytic cycle. We saw this idea um, in, in the context of the oxidative heck coupling. You can have a reductive coupling where you have two different or organohalide electrophiles, and then you just need a terminal reductant. In the context of nickel couplings, these, these are often um, 
uh, metallic zinc or metallic manganese and sometimes organic, um, uh, strong organic reductants can do the trick as well. And then this mode, this is not really like textbook stuff, but this is just my own way of, of sort of organizing reactivity um, that, that, that we're interested in our lab, which are, we call conjunctive cross couplings. And here I'm borrowing some nomenclature from, from Jim Morkin's lab. The idea being reactions that have very similar constitution to a classical cross coupling, but they have a third reaction partner that serves as the linchpin to unite the two classical reaction partners in a cross coupling. And we'll cover just very briefly a couple examples of that so you can see, see what this means. But those conjunctive units, which I've abbreviated Y here, are things like CO, they're, they're basically ambiphilic reaction partners, things like CO, SO2, alkene, alkyne, um, in situ generated carbene, et cetera. And so if you encounter on a problem set or on an exam, something that looks like a three component coupling then, then, then th th that has cross coupling building blocks, then, then you can just fall back to this catalytic cycle and think about how it's, it's all gonna come together. One of the interesting aspects of the historical development of this, this field, and I would just invite, if anybody wants to see a timeline of when key milestones in this area, um, were um, um, uh, came to be. Then, then there's a handout uh, that will uh, that accompanies today's class that that has such a timeline. Uh, and there's a review article from um, from Victor Sneakus, uh, the late the late uh, Victor Sneakus, um, that uh, that. Uh, highlights this this timeline in, in quite a, quite a bit of um, of, of detail, um, and and this topic, as you can imagine, since it won the Nobel Prize in, in 2010, uh, has been reviewed a, a number of times. I've just highlighted three leading reviews that are commonly cited here, uh, but there are many that, that 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 you could dig up here. And historically, if one looks back, one of the things that's interesting is that um, you had this initial burst of activity with with nickel. Um, and then it kind of faded away and palladium for, for much of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even 2000s really uh, was, was receiving the lion's share of the attention. And now, and now things have come full circle where nickel is being appreciated for some of its unique abilities, particularly in the realm of alkyl couplings. Um, and, and, and what happened in between this, this switch from, from nickel to palladium has to do with the fact that palladium has these easier to study two electron processes so the systems are, are more predictable. Um, and then as, as, as we'll touch on briefly, um, a lot of the early work in cross coupling concerned alkenal reaction partners and alkenal reaction partners in nickel tend to undergo easy isomerization. Um, and, and so the reactions are non-stereospecific which was not ideal for the applications people are looking at then like synthesis of, of uh, linear polyenes. Okay, so now let's jump into some um, um, actual um, reactions here. Uh, and so like, like a lot of um, developments in organometallic chemistry, uh, the catalytic variants of these reactions ultimately um, uh, uh, blossomed out of fundamental stoichiometric studies. And so that's what we have here. Um, so, so maybe, um, let's see, Sung Han, can you, can you just unpack what's going to happen in this, in, in this first reaction here reported by, um, Chat and Shaw, what, what would you expect? Uh, I expect the R group on Grignard region may do a transmetallation and displace the bromide. Okay. And how is it gonna displace one bromide, both bromides? What do you think here? Uh, I would say both bromide. Okay. Any reason? Uh, I think 
previously we said if the halide can combine with a electropositive metal, it, it will be a good driving force. Beautiful. I could not have said it uh, better myself, Han. Nice job. So this shows the elementary step of transmetallation, and 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 then and then you might be curious of you know why doesn't this quickly undergo reactive elimination? Likely, this is because the intermediate is frozen in a in a trans trans configuration here and can't can't undergo cis trans isomerization. Also, in one of the cases, you're using this bulky mes group, which is going to undergo uh, slow slow reductive elimination. Okay, Sung Han, while I've got you on here, maybe walk us through one more, one more example. So now you have um, something that is not unlike what was generated in the first step. It's a dialkyl nickel com containing a bipy and then bidentate ligand. And just letting this react with chlorobenzene, what, what would you expect might happen? I expect it will do the oxidative addition first. Okay, and what would the product be then? You would have uh, chloride and aryl on nickel. And then could you think through like, what would the oxidation state of nickel in that case be? Let's just unpack this. So we've uh, got nickel two plus here. Yeah, so maybe plus four after oxidative addition. Okay. And does, wh wh how do you feel about that? Do you see a lot of uh, like nickel no. plus four in the literature? Okay, it does exist, but it's it's high energy. Normally requires some special stabilizing ligand. So so what else could happen here? I like this idea of oxidative addition, but is there any way to get to a more reactive and more electron rich form of, of nickel for your oxidative addition step? Mm -hmm. So let's just pretend the chlorobenzene isn't there. What would you what would you think might happen if you just heated up the starting material in an arbitrary solvent? Uh, would you the proton at the position you highlight and maybe form a carbon? Uh, you could something like a sigma bond met metathesis type of type of pathway is not unreasonable, but that would be maybe more with an early earlier transition metal. Um, let's think back to this, this, this holy trinity, holy catalytic trinity. Sorry if this is, if that's, hopefully nobody thinks I'm being blasphemous here. Um, this, when you have a di organo, um, a, a, a organometallic species that has two organic fragments on it, particularly in a cis orientation, also, you will do a reductive elimination first. Aha, very good. In that case, it's butane, which might, depending on the reaction conditions, you could imagine just, just bubbling off potentially. And then that would get you to now a low valent and thus more reactive nickel zero. And now let's just go back to what you proposed straight away. Maybe I'll draw this down here so this is clear. So loss of butane, generation of a reactive low valent nickel zero, and then oxidative addition now to a new nickel to and here you have a um, whoops reductive elimination step and an oxidative addition step and hopefully you can see how now this is in a in, in stoichiometric experiments is starting to recapitulate what are going to be all the building blocks of the full catalytic cycle. Super, thank you, Sinhan.
So these studies um, can, uh, took place in the, in, the, in the 60s and then the early 70s was when this explosion of, of, of research in, in catalytic um, um, examples uh, came, came, came to pass. Um, and, and so let's consider one of the, 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 uh, the, the very first reports um, of the Kumada-Koryu coupling. So here the naming system and again, this is um, summarized in the in the handout. Um, in a cross cross coupling, um, historically the, the the names associated with the couplings has to do with the organometallic nucleophile, the so-called transmetallating agent used. So, in the case of Grignards, we have a Kumada Koryu coupling, and a lot of these reactions there are multiple contributors, sometimes simultaneously, sometimes over a number of years, and, and so that. That also the, the names that are used are not totally consistent, but that's true across a lot of organic chemistry. So the kumata koryu coupling is, is, is this catalytic coupling of Grignard reagents and um, organohalides. Again, the first manifestation of that was with, was with um, nickel. And, and, and you'll see this theme uh, that I'll come back to of as time uh, has progressed from the 1970s to now, you'll see an increasing emphasis on things that actually undergo transmetallation more slowly, that, but that use coupling partners that, that have better functional group compatibility. So the Kumata coupling is great for, um, for rapid transmetallation and great for some sort of specialized hindered couplings. But of course, a lot of reactions that you wanna do don't tolerate using stoichiometric equivalents of a Grignard reagent. So that, that is the, that is the uh, dis disadvantage. And an and, and interesting sort of fun fact here is that in, in the Kumada lab, the, 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 the scientist um, and junior investigator at, who, who, who led this was, was another famous Japanese chemist, uh, uh, Tamao. So in, in, in the, especially the Japanese chemical community, sometimes Tamao's name is associated with this, with this, um, with this reaction. Okay, so let's... Um, just consider this um, modern example, and this is meant to illustrate the point um, made uh, that I just made that that this reaction is good for um, these hindered couplings, because you can imagine that transmetallating agents that are not as reactive as Errol Grignard ha would have difficulty getting the, the organic group onto the onto the metal. Uh, and then just to highlight we had we had covered. We'll talk as we go case by case um, of, of different um, ways to prepare the corresponding nucleophilic starting materials that are used. We covered the preparation of organomagnesium um, um, reagents in, in in the main group lecture, so so we won't rehash those details here. Uh, let's jump over to problem of the day number one, and and this we covered in passing in a previous lecture, so we can potentially do this one quickly. Um, one of the things that you encounter, like let's say, let's take a look at this example with uh, of the kumata koryu coupling. You go in with a nickel two precatalyst, and and as we um, as, as we saw, um, nickel two to nickel four oxidative addition is is is, is not typically energetically. Um, um, uh, uh, allowable based on the, uh, the, the redox potentials involved. And so you've got to get down to your active um, uh, uh, oxidation state, which is in the case of nickel, typically going to be nickel zero or nickel one. In the case of palladium is almost always going to be palladium, palladium zero. So let's talk about a couple of ways that you can get to the active um, oxidation state of the catalyst. And again, this, this I think is important to understand in terms of your reading of the literature because you'll sometimes see a palladium-2 precatalyst used. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a palladium-2-4 catalytic cycle or palladium-2-2 catalytic cycle. Um, you have to think about the other components and what's the most likely. Okay, so um, 
let's first consider um, the, uh, the reaction number one shown. Uh, Brendan, what's going to happen here? Uh, so the first one will just be two transmetallations and then um, uh, reductive elimination to give the dimer and the uh, palladium zero. Beautiful. Okay. So we're in all in all these cases we have palladium two as the starting material. Palladium two again. And then you said palladium zero plus bi bi -aryl. Very good. Okay, Daniel, how about this next one? Um, so would you get ligand exchange with the sodium acetate to displace the chloride? Uh, you, you, you could, you could do that. Uh, how is that going to get you to palladium zero? Um, So let's say you have reversible exchange, chloride, acetate. So maybe I'll just ask what's in, what in solution here is the most reducing? Is it phosphine, chloride, acetate? Uh, phosphine. Ah, okay. So we need to push the electrons from the phosphine to the palladium and here we can get an assist from the acetate such that the, the, the these arrows are kind of like you know cartoon reaction arrows but the ultimate driving force as we covered again briefly last time is going to be formation of of the um, triphenylphosphine oxide. And so the common ingredients here are going to be some palladium-2 precatalyst, like maybe palladium acetate itself, plus a phosphine ligand, typically in excess. You need at least two equivalents of, of phosphine relative to metal. Um, or, you know, palladium chloride precatalyst, so let's say palladium-2 bis triphenylphosphine, uh, palladium-2 chloride bis triphenylphosphine, plus um, some oxygen-based inorganic base like potassium carbonate, potassium phosphate, uh, et cetera. And then the last one I think was one we covered briefly, but now let's actually draw it out a, a little bit more clearly. Um, Nathan, how about, how about this one? So, um, would you have coordination and then uh, reductive elimination at the nitrogen? Uh, what, what and what reductive elimination? Uh, oh, sorry, beta hydride elimination first. Ah, okay. Whoops, I pushed arrows in the wrong way and people, I'm... So now you have a palladium two hydride and then your Palladium 
palladium two hydrides you can kind of think of as quasi palladium zero. They're, they're already reduced as long as there as long as there's some base present. And then the byproduct here is going to be as we as we covered your oxidized amine. Okay, so we went through that quickly before, but I thought it's good to actually draw it out and push arrows so that everybody is, is crystal clear on that. Okay, so let's march, march forward now. We're going from transmetallating agents where the metal is, is more, most electropositive to progressively more electronegative, meaning that we're getting less polarized carbon, um, uh, carbon metal or carbon metalloid bonds. Uh, that's going to improve our functional group compatibility for po polar function functionality, but it's going to introduce some complications with transmetallation, as you're going to as you're going to see. Okay, so um, palladium, as I, as I alluded to, started to get preferred to nickel because of its stereospecificity in various alkenylation um, reactions. And this played an important role for Nagishi, the Nagishi lab's interest in, 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 in expanding beyond Kumata couplings to some of the other coupling partners that they, that they employed. And, and, and nickel is able to, um, or, or, or in general, one, one thing that is important to note is that these alkenal metal species, as shown here, are actually able to undergo this. And this seems to be for reasons that are um, still not totally clear in the literature, at least to my knowledge. This seems to be more facile for nickel than for um, palladium, but does also happen with, with palladium. And, and it's, it's commonly proposed that this would pr proceed via what's called an eta-2 um, alkenal metal. And so, so this, um, served as part of the genesis for, for interest in palladium and then also the interest, continued interest in these alkenal, you'll see many of the early examples are with alkenal reaction partners. I'm just trying to paint a picture of, of what was going on and what people were thinking about and concerned about at that, at that time. Um, what, sorry, when you say eta-2 alkenal metal, do you mean that it would essentially undergo oxidative addition? Is that what you mean? Or like coordinate to the other carbon of the alkene? Like would it form a three-membered ring? Yeah, these are it's a it's a good question, Newer. And I think this is, is kind of like it, it's kind of wacky, wacky stuff. So I, I tried to just get away without talking about it, but but it's good. I'm glad I'm glad that you asked about it. Um so I'll draw something and you're just gonna say like it, this looks like a wacky structure and 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 yeah, it is a wacky structure. Um So, so it's 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 things that look like look like this. Okay, um, so I have the another pi, question. The, the, you, you, right, the pi, the pi, it's it's not just a carbon metal single bond. The pi system is also in bond, involved in, in 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 bonding. So it's not a very planar system. Uh, cor correct. Okay, so for the nickel and the fact that it sort of undergoes this isomerization faster, does that have anything to do with the fact that it, it might be operating with radical conditions? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think there are enough examples where you wouldn't expect single electron transfer to be operative 
um, that that we could at least say that that's not what's going on all the time, if that if that makes sense. So, um, you know, some of these some of the conditions where th th that I can think of off the top of my head where this has been documented with nickel, they don't they don't necessarily use the 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 the, the, the inputs that you'd expect for a radical radical based processes. There's another manifestation of that. I don't want to. I don't want to belabor this point too much. But but this eta two. If this if this form, the way I've drawn this here is sort of uncomfortable. You can also think about pushing arrows to make a a, a carbene or carbonoid intermediate that allows you to to um, weaken that carbon carbon double bond that that you could you could imagine would would be enough to to allow that rotation to take the, the requisite CC bond rotation to take place. Okay, so mar marching forward, uh, Nagishi's first foray into this into this um, 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 area was, uh, and he has a, a famous paper where he, he documents like a, a, a huge library of different transmetallating agents. But the first intermediate step uh, in, in terms of synthetic pursuits was to use these organoaluminum reagents. Um, and, and 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 these were were, were fine uh, were suitable for making these one three diene products, but again didn't really get around this problem of of very limited um, uh, functional group compatibility. So some att attention then shifted to um, organo zirconium reagents, and you can imagine um, that part of the appeal here of using organo aluminums and uh, organo zirconiums is the ability to to undergo robust hydrometallation with the corresponding zirconium hydride like Schwartz reagent or the cor corresponding aluminum hydrides to the alkyne to rapidly generate the alkenal metal species. And in the context of these investigations and the Gishi lab made this very interesting observation that when the reaction was performed in the presence of zinc chloride, there was a, there was a dramatic effect room temperature one hour, 88% yield in this coupling versus 0% yield after one week. I mean, I've got to give whatever a student or postdoc did the experiment with credit here for continuing to check a reaction that was 0% conversion up until, up until one week. That's probably like the experiment you do only because your advisor tell, tells you to. It's like, it's not done after, it hasn't started after six days, but God knows maybe it has a seven day induction period, uh, but, but no reaction without zinc chloride um, and, then, and then super facile coupling with zinc chloride. So, so what's going on here, um, uh, um, Eleanor? Um, is it like you're somehow forming the organo zinc? Beautiful. In situ transmetallation. So this is, is probably the first example of, a, of, a, of what we now think of as a, as a Nagishi coupling, we're just generating the organo zinc um, in situ. And so I would say this is a, um, you know, re reasonably common um, um, strategy or approach in, in, in the cross-coupling literature is that by using, you know, using one transmetallate agent and then with another metal additive, you can get an in, in situ transmetallation in some cases, um, you, you know, th th thus find a lower barrier pathway for, for the transmetallation step. And so now here's just an example of, of what we think of as a sort of a kind of more canonical Nagishi where we have the preformed organo zinc. Um, no, no real surprise here. This is not the, I, I, I totally appreciate this is not the most interesting reaction for the you know, sy synthetic chemists among us. But we're just forming this linkage here. And let's just briefly discuss how, 
how to make organo zinc reagents. Some people in the lab probably have direct experience with this. Um, certainly in Phil's lab, I know they've been making a lot of organo zinc reagents over the last couple of years. Uh, anyone want to volunteer an answer for, for this one? So you can do transmetallation to the zinc halide? Um, and and what uh, what's the other starting material you want to put in when? Um, it can be like organolithium or like Grignard reaction. Beautiful organolithium or Grignard. Here again, just back to our main group lecture, we're we're driving driving this reaction thermodynamically, um, just through electronegativity trends. And then, when any any other ideas for another way to do this? Um, you can do direct reductive. I'm oh, sorry, oxidative addition with zinc from Beautiful. the ally. So now, just metallic zinc, zinc dust probably needs to be activated if we're talking about just practical considerations here. Very good. Okay, any questions on Nagishi? Sorry, we're going through this kind of rapid rapid fire so we can cover as much ground as possible. If you want to make the dye organic zinc, do you just do the transmetallation twice for number one? Or how do you make like diethyl zinc, for example? Ah, good question. Anybody want to chime in here if anyone has done done this? Have you done this in the lab, Ben? Ever? No. Yeah, <clears throat> dimethyl zinc is really dangerous to make because it is flammable above like five ppm oxygen. So. Um, I don't think people ever really make it. I think Derek Lowe has an interesting article on it about him trying to do it in grad school. If anyone's interested, I'll send that out. Is that just controlled by the, stoich the stoichiometry in the Grignard drought? Tanner, do you know off the top of your head? Sorry, I was on mute. No, I think they do it from, uh, I don't think they use Grignard root. They start from zinc zero. Okay. Yeah, we can just send some additional um, re references in, in this in the chat window if, uh, for, for, for clarification. Yeah, thanks for your question, um, Camille. Um, so now moving forward, let's talk about uh, organotin reagents. Um, again, step-by-step step, getting better and better functional group um, tolerance, um, but, but now working with reagents that are increasingly difficult to to, to transmetallate because you don't have the deck stacked in terms of electronegativity. Uh, so here's an early example from Eborn that really set the stage for subsequent developments by Megida and Stilly. Uh, so what's happening in this, um, this process? Um, Omar, are you there? Yes. So how do we make biphenyl under these conditions? Uh -huh. um, I think you just do oxidative addition. Okay. And then... Um, 
And then I think in an off cycle, you do transmetallation. Okay. Because you have to form like the 10 phenyl like reagent. Or, okay. Is that, that's what you said, transmetallation? Yeah. And then you said form the organotin reagent via reductive elimination. This, this reaction, we won't cover this just in the interest of time, but this is, this is resemblant of a, of a reaction called the neoboroborylation, where you use typically B2 pin2 and you get a similar, similar process taking place. So now you basically generate your, your stilly nucleophile in situ, and then it can just react, react further. So again, it's sort of a disguised stilly where you're, you're, you're making your stilly nucleophile uh, as, uh, as, as you go. Thank you, Omar. And, and so uh, based on this contribution, then, 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 then simultaneous or near simultaneous publications from uh, the Megiddo lab and, and, then, and then the Stille lab um, demonstrated what we now think of as the canonical Stille or Megiddo Stille. Uh, interestingly, Megiddo's first report concerned these acyl, acyl chloride um, electrophiles. So, so, I mean, you could argue that it might be a little bit more debatable what's actually going on here. How much is the carbonyl um, uh, contributing to, to, to reactivity? Uh, is, it, is it something more, more akin to a polar, polar addition process than an organometallic process? But, but um, you, you, can't, you can't argue with the, the, the results um, anyway. And then, and then the early report from, from Stilly's lab can, can um, um, consisted of this al tin coupling to organo halides to produce, um, and, and these two reactions produce uh, ketones and, and al benzene derivatives um, re respectively. An, an interesting point of, 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 of trivia for people who are interested in, in historical organometallic trivia is that the first author on, on the first report of the Stille coupling is the now famous, very, very, very famous chemist, David, David Milstein. So I always think of that, like, you know, if you discover the Stille coupling as a, as a grad, so he's a postdoc, I think, uh, before even starting your independent career, you've really set the bar, bar high for yourself, although, although you know, Milstein has, uh, has lived up to that billing. And so the key part, and, and I think this would probably be evident for anybody who's done a Stille coupling is that the, the a key aspect of the, of the Stille um, a key advance offered by the Stille coupling is the now much improved functional group tolerance of these organotin coupling partners. Um, ease of synthesis and also synthetic flexibility because you can, unlike any of the other agents we covered before, you can actually bring, bring the carbon tin bond through multiple chemical operations. So let's see how that plays out in um, practice here. Let's consider this example where we, what did I do here? My starting material doesn't have any tin in it. That would uh, defeat the purpose of this, okay. Oops. Okay, Aaron, walk us through what's gonna happen here. Um, well, first you would, Oxidized to the aldehyde, I'm guessing, and then the uh, Horner Wadsworth Emmons. Okay, very good. First, uh, this is a, a key point here is that even in the presence of these, condi these, these conditions where you're oxidizing alcohol to aldehyde, your organometallic can, can survive. That's, that's not, that wouldn't be the case with, uh, with the previous systems studied. So you make aldehyde. And then you said HWE, I think I heard. Yeah.
again, reasonably, reasonably forcing reaction conditions, things that you wouldn't expect to be um, well tolerated if you had a carbon zinc bond in your molecule, for example. Um, and then oh. let me, and then, and then just, uh, just w walk us home here for this last step, Aaron. Yeah, well, within, well, so the cross coupling would occur where your triflate is present. And now the last step, thanks, Aaron, is uh, is just a cross coupling here between tin organo tin and organo pseudo halide here being the triflate. Very good. Any questions on that synthetic sequence? I think it's all fairly routine chemistry, but the point the point being that you can you can actually do routine chemistry in the in the presence of, of, of something that you can then you can then cross couple. So as I said, the, as, as we're moving to more electronegative um, uh, elements now, our inherent transmetallation rate is, is, is lower. And so we sometimes need to, um, have strategies for enhancing the rate of, of, of transmetallation. Uh, we'll, we'll see this manifest in a, in a specific example. Um, 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 shortly. Um, so one way to do this is to modify the ligands on tin. Another way is to use a, a, a promoter and, and one that's often used here. Um, is uh, copper. Where again, this, this is resembling of what we saw before. Now you can have a, a sequence where you transmetallate from tin to copper to, to palladium. And so instead of a barrier that looks like this, you have two barriers that, that, are, that are, more, are, are more manageable. So here's an example of, of this, this former point I was making about controlling the ligands on tin as a means of accelerating um, uh, 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 transmetallation. And, 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 and uh, so, so Stone, could you, could you give an explanation here of what, what is going on with this complicated looking reagent called a carbostanitrine, first developed by Ed Bidace and then developed further by, prominently by Mark Bisco. I guess you're weakening the tin methyl bond. Ooh, you got some feedback, I think. Oh, okay, now it's gone. And 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 yeah, you're you're right on track here. So how how do you do that? Or or what is the physical organic explanation of why that bond is weaker? Maybe I should say. Oh, I guess donation. Of Uh, donation of uh, yeah the nitrogen lone pair into the tin methyl. Beautiful. Okay, so in practice, then that leads to elongate. I'm going to draw this in dramatized form. Elongation of the carbon tin bond, increasing delta minus character on the methyl, and and then just overall increased nucleophilicity. Super stone. Well, I just have a quick question. So, like, how, how do you sure. prepare that thing reagent? 
Ah, that's a good question. How would you like to prepare it? Would you have any ideas? What's the retrosynthesis for this? I don't know if hydrospanulation is a good idea for that molecule. Okay. I, I think I think in practice, well, here's a here's a case down below where we're using more structurally complex carbostanitrines. And I think in these systems, and as always, someone should correct me if I if I have this wrong. What's um, it, it, there's a kind of a modular building block, which is the corresponding tin chloride. And then what you can actually do is reduce this into a nucleophilic form of tin and then, and then react it with mesylates, if that, if that makes sense. Um, so the other thing you could do, um, when is, is, is from this, then, then do like a Grignard style transmetallation. Okay. So with the Grignard or the organolithium, and then here. So then this this actually just switches one question for another question, which is um, then how you'd make this thing if you don't want to pay Sigma Aldrich for the for the for it. And anybody have a, a thought here? Whoops, this is going to be inverted because it's a SN2 type addition. So this, I think, has got to be two different steps. Any thoughts here? Don't don't all chime in at at, at once. <laughs> I always hated it when professors said that, and now I now I do it because I don't know how to fill awkward silence otherwise. Well, I don't know if you can start with like tin tetrachloride, but then like you need like that nucleophile to kick out the three chloride. Yeah, I think there there are a couple different kind of polarity modes you could you could think about. You could think about adding a, a tris nucleophile, tr tris organometallic nucleophile to tetrachloroquin. You could think about what you proposed, Win, which was um, insightful, where you take trial amine and do a triple hydrostanylation as as well. Um, or you could think about going in the with the tris halide, corresponding tris halide under reductive conditions and going in that that way um, so those are kind of the different polarity modes you could you could think about I'd have to double check I think that the, the tris hydrostanylation is is uh, uh, is a, a, at least one one way that they that they, they do this commonly yeah they use Schwartz reagent for that and then transmetallate. Uh, tris tris hydrozirconation and then transmetallate. okay yeah thanks Okay, and so here's an example, as, uh, as, as alluded to from the BISCO lab, where they take this enantio enriched organometallic. We talked about this, this modern advent of methods to make enantio stereochemically defined organometallic reagents that, that can then participate in either stereo retentive or stereo invertive reductive elimination. In this case, it's, um, it's uh, stereo uh, retentive, as, as, as you can see. And so they not only take advantage of the stanitrain activation mode, but here you see also the presence of, of, of copper. Um, and so in addition to this process by which 
um, copper can serve as an intermediary transmetallation reagent. Can you think of any other benefit of, 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 of copper in a, in a cross coupling? Um, I'll leave this open for, for a second and then comment if nobody wants to, to chime in. So always in these complex multi-step cycles, you're, you're fighting a battle about having an open coordination site when, when you need it. And, and, and um, in the presence of, of phosphine ligands, particularly excess phosphine ligands, uh, you can find the situation where the phosphine is binding at the, at the wrong time. And so um, copper can also play this role of, 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 of allowing you a low energy state where one of the ligands is pulled off of the of the of the metal and that could be true also for other soft metals but as soft metals go copper is a pretty cheap cheap one if you need to use it in this in this way and has good affinity for for phosphine um does the ari coupling partner has the halogen or is this the ch activation chemistry oh thank you win thanks for catching my typo yep And also, like in that reaction, not only they use copper, they also use like potassium fluoride. Right? Is it also to enhance the transmetallation? Yeah, good, good catch, uh, Win. So, how would this potentially enhance transmetallation rate based on things we've talked about before? I mean, I think fluoride has good affinity towards things, so it's kind of like makes the thing minus, but then like you have that bad nature already, like, I don't know whether if that is necessary. It's a good question. I'd have to check back to see whether the fluoride is uh, necessary. I think my recollection is that maybe it improves the yield, but isn't strictly required which always makes it difficult to sort out then what is the, what is the precise role. But, but in principle, yeah, this is a good point that we can, we can also jot down um, when, which is, um, Again, a common theme as you get to these um, oops. tin, boron, silicon formation of the eight complex, uh, where it formally negative charges on on the the, the the metal metalloid, but in practice it increases the delta minus the nucleophilicity of the carbon ligand as another. Um, important strategy we're going to touch on more systematically later, but good to discuss here as well. Is the copper strategy used in with metals other than palladium ever? Um, for for uh, the intermediary transmetallation or as phosphine scavenger or, or either? As a phosphine scavenger. Uh, yeah, this is a common additive, just as one example, a common way to make the Hoveda Grubbs catalyst from the, from the phosphine containing pre precursor to drive equilibrium. Yeah, good, good question. Uh, that's, that's a stoichiometric or amatolic rate, right? but, but by the same logic, there are other, um, other applications in, in that field and, and, and others you can think about. Okay, so let's move on to um, Suzuki Miura coupling. Uh, this one, I, I don't know if, is there a way to ask through thumbs up, like how many people have run a Suzuki coupling at some point in, in your life? I would just be curious to, to, to know. Okay, pretty, pretty good. At least, at least 50, 
percent, maybe more if people are away from there. Oh, Kelly has this feature that says yes. That's uh, I've not seen that before. That you're getting very sophisticated with your res responses. That's that's neat. Um, um, yeah, obviously it goes without saying. This is one of the workhorse reactions now in CC bond bond, bond formation. If you haven't run it now, if you go into pharma, you will you will run one either in the in your discovery efforts or in your process development efforts. Um, so again, early work here centered on this theme of making um, um, linear linear polyenes in a in a in a modular way. One of the first um, the first examples was taking this terminal alkyne, which should undergo um, hydroboration to make an alkenal uh, uh, boron species, which uh, uh, and, and, and in this case with with catechol as the as the ligand or catecholate as the ligand. On, on, on boron, this this under, is pretty good for transmetallation, but the, these reagents are not super stable. So this is not the, the most widely used family of, of organoborons. Um, and then and then stereospecific cross coupling to make now this geometrically defined um, um, one three polyene. And now we we just touched on this point, so I won't I won't pose it to um, uh, uh, to everybody, but but in this case now, base in a Suzuki coupling is is required, or at the very least, you need to go in with some hydroxide or something to pretreat your or organoboron to to activate it to make the eight complex. In here. The turnover limiting step is normally so either making the eight complex or alternatively, we talked about this alternative formulation where you you first have a hydroxide or some base equivalent that gets on the metal and triggers transmetallation. That way. So here's just a very brief overview of um, some of the common organoborons that that you you see. It's not it's not all of them. If you want a more comprehensive summary, I would direct you to this review from Guy Lloyd Jones Group. Um, and so, in terms of uh, you know kind of the general families that you might encounter, there are uh, boranes. Th these are common if 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 you're um, transferring an alkyl or alkenal because you can use 9-BBN to undergo hydroboration, they undergo hydroboration and then, and then cross-couple directly. That's a common way to do beta uh, or B alkyl Suzuki Miura couplings. Um, boronic esters, um, which as, we'll, as uh, we'll, we'll talk about kind of mechanistically how these, how these function, of course, boronic acids. And then in the past 10 or 15 years, there's been a lot of interest in these masked boron, maybe even more than, than 15 years, certainly more than 15 for the trifluoroborate salts. Um, masked boron reagents. So in the case of the trifluoroborates, these are um, um, largely developed from cross-coupling uh, by, by, by Gary Molander building on early work from um, Vides. And, and these are nice, for, particularly for um, aryl coupling partners that, that undergo fast proto-D uh, deboration like two pyridol or, 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 or very electron poor aryl groups. And the way these are believed to function is slow hydrolysis of the trifluoroborate to introduce um, hy hydroxide um, ligands on boron that can then trigger transmetallation. And then there's these other interesting classes, the DAN and the MITA group um, that are really more like boron blocking groups, boron protecting groups. Um, almost analogous to how a silo group works to protect an alcohol. These can protect boron and at least in most cases, totally shut down reactivity. And then you can work it up with acid or something to cleave, cleave it off. And then now it's, it's, it's reactive. So this can be useful in a, in a strategy that people have pursued called iterative cross coupling where you cross couple, deprotect, cross couple, deprotect. Um, There have been some recent developments, at least with the Dan group, and, and, and under very, very specific conditions where they can transmetallate directly without needing to undergo hydrolysis, but that's still an emerging 
area. Okay, so let's, um, we, we did cover the mechanism um, of, of uh, uh, aryl boron transmetallation in the, the, in the transmetallation section as, as alluded to then. This is, is still very much a topic that's actively being investigated. Um, and and we'll, we'll see an example of that in the next problem of the day. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna do here is we'll, we'll take five, uh, three to five minutes in breakout rooms. And I want you to discuss problem of the day um, two and three. The first is this question about relative rates in this model, transmetallation model system from the hydroxide. Ooh, this should, this is not oxide bridge. This should be ox, uh, hydroxide uh, bridge. So H, H, O, uh, mu two bridging. And then problem of the day number three, which is just gonna build on this, on this theme and, and transition us to the next section. Um, what's the product? Um, what's the name of the reaction? Those are kind of straightforward. And then, and then think about this role of, of fluoride based on discussion that we've already had, paying attention to the stoichiometry and then paying attention to, uh, to this, this SAR data that, that the cyclic uh, silocyclobutane is, is much more reactive. Okay, so let's jump into breakout rooms, discuss, and then we'll reconvene. Everyone see my screen share? Okay, so let's first um, order these uh, as as requested from uh, most reactive to least reactive. And I'm just going to say as a caveat, this uh, th th this this is 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 challenging on two fronts. One, I think it's challenging for you to predict based on first principles, what this order is going to be. The other is it's challenging for the authors, even this is from the Denmark group, to make these measurements. So even though this is like the best controlled model system you could imagine, owing to the complexities of transmetallation, even still in some of these cases, they can't get clean kinetic traces and, and the reactions deviate from, from uh, exhibit some sigmoidal kinetics. So those are the caveats here. That's It's challenging to make these measurements. It's challenging to, pr to predict based on first principles, um, but empirically there's a clear trend. So let's discuss that and discuss uh, why why that why that is? So uh, Hui Chi, what do you what did your team think about here? Oh no no uh, sorry we got a oops, sorry we have a poll I forgot we've got a poll. I never want a poll that Van made to to go to waste. So let's let's uh, poll. Tell me what your team came up with, or if you disagreed with your team, what you think. Um, and then, uh, and then we'll go from there. And then, then we'll have Wei Chi explain her her answer. So we'll give this fifteen seconds to throw out the poll again, because we use these polls to track attendance. If you don't know, then make sure to guess as opposed to not not register an answer. Okay, there is not a lot of consensus here, I would say, so far. Do you want to end the, just please guess if you haven't. And Kui Chi, what did you put? And, and maybe could you walk us through your thinking? Um, actually, we're not sure about the, the rate, relative rate of these reactions. So we were just thinking about the steric um, issues. Yeah. Okay, so based on Sterex, what what yeah. do, what would you expect? Like, would this which would be faster reacting here? So at first we were thinking that maybe the more steric hindered would be less reactive. Okay, I like that thought. So in general, less sterically encumbered, 
uh, aryl boron or ladens on boron are going to lead to faster transmetallation, at least in this step where you, 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 it, it's, it's, you know, like quite simplified, just looking at transmetallation step. Um, and then, and then what else, what else were you thinking about? Uh, so we could this, you know, like also I would say sterically, you could make an argument that this, this falls in this general order. Five membered is less encumbered than six membered. And then the, the, the tetramethyl is gonna be quite encumbered. Okay. And then, and then what else were you thinking about? What else came up in discussion? Yeah, actually for the product acid at first, um, we think that A, it should be the most reactive, but from the poll, I didn't see this choice. So, okay, that's yeah. hard. Yeah, the, the boronic acid is a little bit hard to situate. So so that one is not, is not easy, I, I get that. Okay, so there are a bunch of competing factors and that's why, as I said, this is hard to predict a priori, so it's a hard challenge, but but there is real empirical data that we can just discuss and try to unpack. And I will even say the authors don't have a totally conclusive explanation, but you can you can look here for their best working model. And the factors that are at play are, are a couple here. One, how delta minus is the, um, uh, the, the ipso carbon? Two is how likely or how, what propensity does the boron have to undergo rehybridization from sp2 to sp3? Three, what is the what is the steric bulk? And four, what um, how easy is it to to get onto the metal to open up the free coordination site that you need? And what they find and if this is confusing to you, then you're, you're not alone because I don't think many people got this right in the poll, which is which is fine because it's meant to be a challenging question that we just we just discussed. So so this is what they find empirically. Those factors that I listed are the are the ones that 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 are invoked, um, and then and then I you know uh, maybe in the interest of time we'll, we'll sort of like save questions if 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 you have questions then check out that paper. If your questions aren't answered, I would say then, then we can, uh, we, you know, ping me or the TAs and we can discuss further. Okay, what about um, POD number three here? Um, Nathan. Mm, so uh, first you would have oxidative addition into the arrow I die. Yeah. And then you um, uh, fluorinate the silo partner. Okay. Okay. To activate it. And then you do like a transmetallation. Okay. And then reductive elimination to Oh, sorry, you're asking about the product. Yeah, so then it's just a styrene. Okay, super. And, and and the name of the reaction? I think it's the Hiyama Denmark coupling. Yeah, Hiyama Denmark or just Hiyama if, if you wanna be strict because this uses fluoride as an activator. Uh, and you described the mechanism very nicely, Nathan. Thank, thank you. Uh, and then let's unpack Part B of the question about about what the fluoride's doing. You said it's going to engage with silicon. So why do you need multiple equivalents? And then why? Uh, what what explains this order of reactivity? What What do you think, Nathan? I think that you would make a trifluoro silo species. Trifluoro silo. Okay, but let's All maybe right. just first, what is the first silo gonna, or the first fluoride equivalent gonna do? Um,
Yeah. And then this back. is this is what you this is what you described earlier when you were going through it. You form a silicate that increases the delta minus at the carbon attached to it. Yes. Well, you, you said that it would form a, a, a poly polyfluorinated product. Try, try, and I, I'm um, that it that may be the case, but at least just in terms of um, um, you know, like drawing it out here. This the drawing this as an anionic product would rationalize why you need at least, at least two equivalents of, of fluoride because this byproduct is also gonna scavenge fluoride. Okay, and then what about this question of, of the ligands on silicon affecting reaction rate? Why would the silocyclic butane react so much faster? I think it's just um, tie the ligands together so there is a coordination site on the silicon, or I think you're hinting you're hit, yeah, you're you're hinting at the right thing here, which is that by constraining this angle, this angle here, you lower the barrier, energy barrier for rehab, you make it more prone to rehybridize to this pentavalent state. Because in the pentavalent state, the, 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 the angle inherently is, is smaller than in the tetrahedral state, right? So you, you, you spring load it to make pentavalent. Super, any additional questions on that? Well, it seems that uh, in the structure you drawn uh, uh th this angle is 120 degree and uh, the axo and the equatorial bound angle is 90 degree i think maybe that one is strained oh thank you who was that taiwan yes thanks for catching that yep drawing quickly Oops, oh, but, I, but I thought the uh, that mark kind of showed that like the cyclobutane silicon compounds it's just like under hydrolysis the, the under reaction condition to give the oxo silicon and that is the active species rather than the strain angle. Um. I'm not sure because there are certainly examples where they build in the silocyclobutane and an OH or a, a um, if if you yeah if you have a reference in mind when then then feel free to send it to me and we can we can un, un, unpack that. Okay. Okay, let's, uh, in, in the remaining time we have, we'll, we'll, we'll continue sort of charging through this now. This was the, the transition to the um, discussion of the Hiyama or Hiyama Denmark um, reaction. Historically, this um, is, is underutilized. I think partly it's because by the time it came online, the Suzuki cross coupling was already working and they have overlapping utility in terms of functional group compatibility. And, and Denmark based on extensive mechanistic work has found ways to get around this fluoride requirement. Um, So here's an example of uh, uh, just this chemistry in action, tolerating free alcohols and uh, proceeding. We already covered this in the previous 
POD, so I'll just draw this. Proceeding through this activated eight complex. And in the most modern manifestations of this from, from Denmark, fluoride is not required. And instead these uh, silanol derivatives or silanoate derivatives are, are used. And here the, um, The mechanism um, in these cases is, whoops. Very reminiscent of what we covered in terms of uh, the missing link in transmetallation for organoboron compounds, this so-called palladium O boron linkage. Now we have a palladium O silicon linkage that's the key precursor to trigger, trigger transmetallation. When you're just using the fluoride, um, is that, is there not gonna be Sorry, is there going to be like an inner sphere transmetallation event or outer sphere? It will, I believe, still be inner sphere, Camille. Um, and I think it's been invoked that the um, um, well, there there are a couple different ways you could formulate what a transmetallation um, um, uh, transition state would 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 look like you could have fluoride forming a interaction with both metals. In some cases, instead of these methyl groups, you actually have oxygen containing ligands that can function like bronic esters do in, in, in chelating to the metals. Hey, Kiri, real quick. Yes. Uh, do strained uh, cyclic solo ethers still like increase the rate of the reactivity? Because it seemed like that, that four member uh, silicon compound uh, was, was much faster, but in this case, the trimethyl silo is used. And then in the uh, fluoride free one, but did they do any like analysis of like the, the more strained ring systems? Yeah, and, and so in this case, this, this example here is, is one of the very early ones from Hiyama's lab. So it doesn't have all the bells and whistles of the more modern manifestations. So, so that's why they, if you wanna say they're using a less reactive um, 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 silicon group, that, that was the origin of why, why that is. Um, and then what your, your other question, Daniel, was um, have people studied, has the relative rates of all these different possibilities been studied? Is that kind of what you were getting at? Of like the, uh, the, the fluoride-free silicon, mm -hmm. um, did they study like the cyclic version of that? Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I think. Or is it just like in the reference? The, the, I'll just look that the, up. Later. The Denmark, the Denmark lab, yeah, the Denmark lab has studied a great number of of different possibilities. So I would direct you to this accounts of chemical research from their lab. And if your that uh, doesn't contain the answer to your question, then let's circle back and we can we can hash it out. Okay, we're we're. Uh, about uh, over on time, but let me just finish the CC bond forming parts of, of, of this very very briefly. Um, this part this part will be will be fast. Um, so this one uh, is a is a Sanagashira coupling, um, which uh, many in the audience may have also um, 
run at some point. It's it's one of these magical reactions that you really can do almost anything to it, and it still still seems to to work. And one of the things that is a little bit mechanistically distinct about the Sanagashira, what why it merits its independent its own discussion, um, is that you use copper as a as a co-catalyst here. And actually, in earlier reports from HEC, they had a non-copper version of, of this, which we would call HEC alkylation. But the copper actually plays an integral role because it allows for formation of this copper acetylide. So let's unpack this in this, this dual catalytic cycle. Whoops. I'll go through these very quickly. So in this department, um, of course, it's appreciated that alkyne plus copper one plus, oops, plus base leads to rapid formation of copper acetylide. Now that can interface with a classical palladium zero cycle, transmetallate to this oxidative addition intermediate to give a palladium two aryl alkynyl intermediate that then undergoes reductive elimination to give your aryl a satellite product and regenerate palladium zero. So I'll leave this to you. You know, Phil always asks these challenges. How do you make random heterocycle X without cross coupling? So we'll give you this challenge of how to make this using only cross coupling for the key, for the key CC bond forming uh, events. And I'll just leave this to you to think about in terms of synthetic planning and what group to put where, how you would, how you would construct that. And then the last CC bond forming reaction that I'll, I'll talk about, and, and we covered this previously on a, a problem set, is um, um, alpha, uh, alpha aerylation, where, where now a deprotonated pronucleophile, typically an enolate, uh, can participate analogously to what we've, what we've seen before. Um, so I, because this was covered in a problem set, I won't, I won't go through the details of this. I just show a single example here. Uh, early report from the from the Buckwald lab, where now your organometallic is the the metal enolate, and this is a very valuable way, state of the art methodology really to make these um, alpha aryl carbonyl compounds with with an antio control. Okay, so I think that's a good stopping point, um, and then we can touch on C heteroatom bond forming reactions in the next time I'm instructing. Um, and then the next class will be taught by a guest lecturer, Tianning Dao, who will expand on this discussion focused uh, primarily on reactions with, with radical, that involve radical processes for cross-coupling. Okay, so that's it. Everybody have a great weekend.